Okay, I think it is time to start. I have a pleasure to introduce you next speaker, Wiene Pöhl, from, uh, again, from the University of, uh, Humboldt University of Berlin, Institute for Theoretical Biology. So, Vini, you have one hour. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I, I also briefly say, like Pavel, I, I studied physics, but then I also came to biology to have this group um, to, to work uh, here in my, on my PhD thesis. And uh, yeah, let me just dive right in. So um, the entire group that I'm part of, we all uh, study collective information processing. And um, there, there's been this theory around that because these biological systems, they process info information by the dynamics of many, many interacting parts. So for example, these neurons here or the, the fish, um, that they could profit from being close to um, a critical transition. And there's also, as Pavel already said, there's um, growing evidence that uh, the brain actually, if it's healthy, it's close to, to such a critical transition. And also there's some uh, signatures of critical behavior in animal groups. And so um, why, why do we have this hypothesis from a biological point of view? Um, well, there's this, there are these features of, of a critical or pseudo critical point that could be beneficial for the biological system because um, this increase in susceptibility or in the correlation length uh, may enable a fast and decentralized coordination and uh, make decisions also faster and more reliable in, in risky and uncertain environments. And also it will help um, to be highly susceptible uh, to small environmental changes because then you can detect changes uh, better and transmit them to others. Um, what I want to put an emphasis on here is that um, these biological systems, they exist in, as I said, in risky and uncertain environments. And so there's lots of fluctuations that are within the environment, but also within the state of the individual itself, for example, um, that not all fish, I mean, they may look similar, but they're actually not all similar. They have personalities, they can be hungry, they can be sick. And so um, this, this system changes over time, all the time, and also the environment changes. And so to me, it's very interesting if you if you talk about this um, hypothesis that they should be close to, to a transition, then how do they actually manage to stay there? Or um, how do they also maybe adapt their distance to this transition um, to the state of the group or to the environment? And um, what I want to look at in this talk is also this question, like how do they, if there is a critical transition, how do they um, control their distance to it? And what I found especially interesting in animal groups is that they can also adapt their structure at the same time scale that the environment is changing. So if you, if you think, for example, of the brain, then you have all these links in between neurons and they are fairly static compared to like uh, the stimuli the brain perceives. I mean, they change over time, but not as fast. But for the fish or for the animals in general, uh, they can assume different group states, different um, spatial arrangements quite, quite fast. And um, they, we, we see many evidence of, of different states and those really um, fascinate me and I want to, wanted to work on what does it mean to be uh, in this group and have this ability to not only change your own uh, sensitivity in your own state, but also kind of position yourself within this larger structure and how has this evolved and does it have a function. And um, the, the model system that I'm using to answer all these questions is uh, escape waves, or to try and answer all these questions is uh, escape waves in, in schooling fish. And the questions I want to ask in this talk is, um, well, the first one is just, do the fish actually regulate their collective behavior according to a perceived environmental risk? So do they change how, do, do does, does their, their collective response, for example, to, to a stimulus change if they are scared or if they are hungry? Um, and the second one is, how, um, how do they control this? Is it, um, 
via a change in the individual or via this fascinating to me uh, change in, in group structure. And this is all uh, under the first heading, which I um, called individual and collective encoding of environmental risk, which is also part of the title of the paper uh, we wrote about this. And then the second question, oh yeah, <laughs> and then uh, I, I just wanted to say right now, um, we will find that it's mainly the structural change that uh, encodes this risk. And then the second question is, um, could the fish make use of uh, a pseudo critical point in, in their collective dynamics and do they do so? And that is um, the title of the second paper, is, uh, subcritical escape ways in schooling fish, kind of giving away that we find that these waves are subcritical and then adding some biological perspective to it, we, um, we, we, what's the, well, we attribute um, this to the need to be robust to false alarms, um, which is greater than the need to be able to distinguish really tiny differences and be highly sensitive. So let me start by introducing this um, model system. So what is actually, um, what does this escape wave look like? So we have in in the lab, we have um, groups of small freshwater fish. They are golden shiners. And what you can see is that um, at some point, just randomly, an individual gets scared because maybe it sees some reflection on the water. We don't know. Uh, and then it makes this fast movement, which is called a startle, in order to escape. And this is socially contagious. And then um, more and more uh, individuals follow follow its lead. And then we get this this cascade. So here is some some screenshots of um, yeah of, of this cascade going on, and this is all taken from a publication from uh, Rosenthal et al., which uh, I, I wasn't part of, and it was what my PhD um, built on when I when I started. And uh, what they already found in this uh, publication is that when they from the tracking data, they, they reconstructed all these cascades and they looked at how many, they counted how many individuals take part in, in one cascade. Similar to in neural dynamics, uh, you can also measure like, uh, neural cascades and you can count how many neurons or like how many parts of a brain um, take take part. And then when they look at the distribution of these cascade, of the cascade sizes, and this is a log, log scale, um, then you can see it, it is uh, kind of long-tailed and it uh, has a lot of small cascades and then cascades almost of all sizes, but they get uh, rarer and rarer um, with increasing cascade size. And so how does this help me to, the system help me to answer these questions? Like do fish regulate collective behavior according to perceived environmental risk and how? Um, so luckily, we work together with some very skilled experimentalists, is that the word, experimenters? Um, and, um, and one of them is Matt Sosner, who did his PhD at Princeton. And in his PhD thesis, he also looked at the same fish, the golden shiners, but he did have two experimental conditions. In one, he just let them swim freely, but in the other one, um, he sprayed some, automatically sprayed some substance on the water that make the fish alarm. So the substance it has a funny name because it's German, it's called Schreckstoff, uh, like scary substance if you translate it, I would say. And it's released from the skin of an injured fish. And so if that is in the water, then the fish think there, there was an attack. And um, what you can see in, in the uh, collective behavior is that if the fish are alarmed, you see that cascades get, on average, they get larger. And so that already very conveniently answers the first question is yes, they do regulate um, their collective behavior, which we characterize by uh, cascade size uh, in, in response to the perceived risk. Uh, and now um, the question is like, how, how do they do this? And what we already, can see in the experiments is that um, if you compare the, the median nearest neighbor distance, so that is like the average spacing between uh, individuals, we can see that in the alarm condition, the individuals move closer together. Um, you can also see this in the in videos of the experiments where you have the alarm school where the fish are rather close together and you have the baseline where 
um, they are further apart. And so now we, we already know, okay, they definitely change their group structure because they, they change their density, that's obvious. Um, but it could also be that they also become more sensitive individually and to disentangle if it's just or the group structure or if it's also to some extent and also to which extent um, the individual change. Um, we, we went to modeling and how I think about this collective information processing is then that um, we have all these individual fish that are nodes in my network and they have all these social interactions to other neighbors which Pablo already said it's not obvious which neighbors those are in general and um, so basically then if you if you have one model describing your baseline state and it consists of links and nodes and then you have um, you see your change in average cascade size, then you can say, okay, so either this is all attributed to changes in the links, link distributions, link strength, or it is uh, also some, some change in the load dynamics in this type of model. And so now I'll, um, yeah, I'll disentangle basically what is the contribution of the change in links and nodes to this change in um, startling cascade size. So I'll start by um, explaining the kind of node dynamics we, we are using and um, it, it very conveniently in that Rosenthal paper they already um, modeled this, this um, starting cascades and they found out that it's a, a fractional contagion process which I will tell you in a bit about. Um, so basically our model is it's like a very simple SIR so it's a susceptible state here which is the normal swimming state and then it's the infected state which is the, the when they started which lasts for a fixed time here and then there's re recovered state when they have started and uh, um, is normally swimming again so uh, this is obviously it's borrowed from from epidemiolo epidemiology um, yeah but it also it has been generalized to um, include behavioral contagion and that's why we took it from these this paper here um, yeah, and then what happens is if a node has infected neighbors, it receives doses, activation doses from these neighbors um, at a rate that is proportional to the link weight between them. And um, these doses, they, yeah, it's a stochastic process. So they just um, here get this time series of inputs, for example, for one node, and it has a fixed memory um, time over which it integrates these inputs. So if you look at the, the single node, it may have uh, like a cumulative number of cues that it has integrated over it, what has it has in its memory that uh, has a time evolution like this, for example. And then um, once this cumulative uh, doses uh, reach a threshold, um, the individual gets activated as well. And yeah, as I said, uh, it's a fractional contagion process. It's just uh, a minor thing here, but important for my other project. Um, it's basically that um, the doses an individual receives is proportional, like anti-proportional to the number of neighbors it has. And that's also like biologically motivated that um, it kind of it also pays attention to to others who don't um, who don't start it, so it gets some sort of negative feedback from them, which tells it to to just uh, relax basically. Um, so that's why why there's this one over um, this one over the degree of the individual. Okay, but um, basically, so this is all characterized by this one threshold value, which gives you the sensitivity of an individual. So that is our one parameter that we have here. So now I'll, I'll come to the, the networks. So um, these interaction networks, they are empirically derived from first responders, because um, if we just look at the first two starters, then we have the clearest causality kind of because we know the second individual must have 
at a high probability uh, reacted to that first one. And then we can um, we can construct, for example, the visual perception of each individual of the first startling individual. But we can also look at other measures, which, um, for example, are the log metric distance between the first responder and the initial starter, or the ranked angular area, which I explain on the next slide, or like other measures, for example, uh, the angular position or the loom is like how quickly um, the visual uh, visual size of this thing uh, changes. Well, anyway, um, this is um, was already done in the Rosenthal paper and it's also done in our paper. It's um, basically some using some statistics to infer which features are most predictive of a uh, startle response and it turns out that this log metric distance and so the log of the metric distance between two in individuals and um, the ranked angular area are most predictive and the ranked angular area is basically just numbering the individuals by their size in the visual field so this one is the largest so it's the, the first and this is the second largest so it has a ranked angular area of two and then uh, doing a logistic regression on those two features again with the first responder data uh, then determines these these coefficients here and this whole formula gives you a link strength if you input basically the distance between the two nodes and the ranked angular area okay <clears throat> so yeah uh, what is what is very good is that for both the alarmed and the baseline state, this is basically the same functional dependence. So it's the, these coefficients are basically the same. So that is very good for us. Um, and then the interesting part is because we have this this change in density, we also have a change here in this uh, log metric distance and the ranked angular areas, which then gives us hugely different uh, network properties because. Uh, these links here, they get stronger when the individuals are closer together. So you can see that the link weight for the alarm case where the fish are closer together, they are, um, they are they're more strong, more stronger links. So this is, yeah, histogram of link, link weights. Um, and then you can see, because it's a visual interaction, you can see that when the fish are closer together, they can they have more visual occlusion so they see fewer of the neighbors so there's an effect here that you have a lower number of neighbors when you are uh, in the alarm state and then overall if you if you kind of uh, if you calculate a weighted degree or a strength of a node so that is just the sum of all the weighted links incoming links it has and then you see the alarm still has a higher weighted degree because it has fewer links, but they are also so much more strong that, um, yeah, overall it's stronger. So we definitely have this structural change. And now the question is, is this change in the network structure, is it enough to um, explain the difference in the cascade sizes that we saw before? Um, yeah, exactly. So um, the two sets of networks that we have, they encode this change in the special group structure. And what we now do next is, we fit this threshold value to uh, of, to each of the data sets to see um, what the individual sensitivity uh, in both states is that best describes the, the individual fish. So how do we do this? Um, so we have these networks from, from the data. And what we do is we initially infect one individual in what we use, uh, I didn't say we use static networks for this. Um, yeah, so we initially infect one individual and then uh, we use different threshold values and depending on the threshold value, the cascade initiated by this uh, spreads further or not so far. And then we can build basically this cascade size distribution for each uh, threshold value and see which threshold best describes um, the cascade size distributions that we saw in the experiments. We do this via log likelihood uh, approach. And so what comes out of this is that actually 
we can uh, describe both data sets with the same, almost the same um, threshold. So these, these are uh, credible intervals for, for the fit of this uh, threshold parameter, so for the fit of individual sensitivity, and they, they overlap. And also then we can, with this model, we can kind of reproduce the experimental observations. Those dots are experimental observations and the lines are uh, the model with these thresholds. And, and just to be sure that maybe this tiny difference in threshold that we have here is, uh, is really important and that the our model we have is very uh, sensitive to this, we also did the following. So we have um, here this average cascade size for, for the baseline. So that's the black, black dots data set. And then we just used um, the threshold from the alarm state. So we just changed the threshold and then simulated cascade sizes again. And so we could look at the effect of just the change in threshold. And we found it doesn't really have any effect. So the average cascade size chain uh, stays roughly the same. And then we said, okay, but what if we leave the threshold as it is in the in the baseline state, but we change all the positions. Um, so we leave the individuals the same, but we just move them closer together. And that actually um, is this darker gray bar here that accounts for most of the observed change in average cascade size. And then this, this red bar is just if we do both, uh, it, it even gives a, a stronger effect. And this is uh, what we observe in the experiments as well. So coming back to my questions, I think I've answered them both. Yes, they do um, change their collective behavior according to perceived risk. And this happens mainly via a change in the group structure. So now we can come to the second project and the second question I wanted to answer, which is, um, could, is there a critical point and are the fish close to this critical point? So. The idea behind how we try to answer this is that um, that we say, okay, if we, we now know this is the fish use in nearest neighbor distance to control the, the how, how fast this contagion spreads, and basically from how we set up the model, we already know okay, that, that there has to be a transition to at some point if we, for example, if we lower the threshold really, really far, then cascades will always uh, become global. So we have this kind of uh, transition in response to one initial startler. Um, and yeah, so, so our, next, our next aim is basically to expand our predictions to a, a larger range of nearest neighbor distances. And also how we want to find this uh, maximum susceptibility is that we will look at the difference between cascades that we initiate by one uh, activating one individual and those that we initiate by activating two individuals and then um, yeah the difference of these two will should have a peak somewhere and that's what we say is, is this peak in kind of in, in susceptibility because um, because we we say the number of initial starters is somehow proportional to, to a change in the environment or in this, uh, yeah, in, it's, it's kind of like an external field. Um, okay, so let's summarize our experimental observations from the data set that we've seen before. What we already know is we have um, this baseline state at some nearest neighbor distance and it has a, a low average relative cascade size and then we know one other region of densities that we could also observe experimentally and that has a higher average uh, relative cascade size. And so then what we did is we filled basically the space in between by rescaling uh, the positions, the, the space uh, of the data that we have. So I think, yeah, this one here is uh, the original scale school and then we just um, may move them closer together or further apart uh, to get different densities and to fill up this plot. Um, yeah, for this we needed to reconstruct this visual field because the, that's what interactions are based on and uh, also we, we approximated individuals as ellipses for this. 
Yeah, and then we could fill up uh, our prediction of relative cascade size for the different densities. And yeah, this I already explained. And um, then we subtracted, as I said here, we subtracted cascades started by two from uh, and one. And we found that there actually is, is a peak in the difference between these two cascade sizes, um, which we attribute to, to a, a critical, pseudocritical point in the collective dynamics. And we also see, yeah, here, and we also see that um, our experimental observations are subcritical because they, they are not right here, they are a bit more towards local, um, local cascades or small cascades. Um, but what we also see is that when the fish get alarmed, they do go closer to this, um, to this pseudo critical density. So maybe, maybe they do make use of at least a, a bit of the increased sensitivity close to this point. And um, another important feature is that um, because we are talking about two dimensional schools here all the time and also in our um, creation of densities, different densities, so like denser schools, we always made sure that they do not overlap. Uh, because of that, we have like a, a max, uh, a minimum distance between neighbors that we can reach. So we can't really see the, the other half of this here going down. And also it, it means that just by changing density, it's, it's really unlikely that the fish will get here to this um, really sensitive point because that would almost certainly mean that they are touching all the time. And then I think our, own, our whole model will have a lot of problems because it's, uh, yeah, it's unlikely that the type of interaction doesn't change at really high densities. Okay, um, then the last question what, uh, we, we then ask is, well, maybe we are looking at one type of fish and also we are looking at them in the lab and maybe if we had a real predator or if, if it was more noisy in the environment uh, or maybe if those fish had not lived in their entire life in a, in a lab but had actually seen some real predators, maybe they would, they would have different uh, average response thresholds. Um, and so we looked at, just plotted this entire um, parameter space of what if they changed density and what if they changed individual threshold and then we can see there's this maximum in sensitivity so this uh, pseudo critical point and we can see that if they also became more sensitive individually so they lowered their threshold then within reasonable density um, ranges they could also become critical. Um, yeah, so then comes biology and the question, why aren't they critical? So, so the idea that we had when looking at the difference between one and two initial starters was, well, it's close to what statistical physics usually do. So it's like a, it's a small difference in an external field, which we say it's a, it's a predator. It's like it's a weak probability or weak predator field and a stronger predator field. But actually, what, what might be relevant also is that depending on the group density in these schools, we have this trade-off between, um, well, basically what occup occupies my, my field of vision. If I'm in a very loose school, then I don't see much of my neighbors, like they're all far away and I have very weak interactions to them, but it leaves lots of possibilities for the individuals to detect a predator, which is this white circle here in the middle, uh, themselves. And then if you increase the density, then you see um, they, they see like fewer and fewer individuals can actually see this predator. Um, but as we know before, they then have stronger interactions. So it's kind of a, a trade-off of many uh, inputs to this system um, and a, and a weak trans transmission strength within it or or the opposite like everything is transmitted to everyone all the time but but there's just few signals coming in so you yeah you have this this trade off and um, so what we what we did is instead of using 
one or two individuals um, to, to start the cascades in the beginning. We now said, okay, uh, a noise queue will always be just one random individual starting. So we just always say, okay, this is uh, this is just um, the same for all densities. But to model the response to a predator queue, uh, we, we said it's actually a changing number of initial starters that we uh, that we use to simulate cascades in response to a predator. And this is based on on how many fish can see a predator theoretically at, at this distance. Um, yeah, and then if we uh, aha, did I not include it? Okay. Uh, so then if we start cascades just by one as we have before and we start cascades by this and we compare cascade sizes and um, and combine them, we can, we can, no, let, sorry, let me start over. Okay, so now we have cascades in response to a predator and um, we have cascades in response to noise. And what is important to an individual, if it, as was already pointed out in the discussion, is that it wants to respond to a predator all the time and it does not want to respond to noise. So it can make two types of errors. One is um, it can startle if there is no reason for this. And then it just loses energy and it can't eat. And, and uh, that's not good for its survival. And it can also not startle um, when a predator is actually attacking. And that then also has some cost to the individual. And so um, in, in a very, very simplistic uh, model, first step, we, we said, okay, we just take the average cascade size um, in response to a noise queue as the individual's probability to respond to a noise queue. And so the individual probability for, to make this kind of error. And similarly, with the other cascade sizes, we estimated the probability to not respond when you have a predator. And then we associate a cost to both errors, and then we sum those costs up. And the costs, in our case, are given by this relative noise cost, um, which is just one giant, like one, one parameter that basically characterizes the, the ratio between like what is more costly. Is it more costly to not startle when, when there's a predator, or is it um, more costly to um, to respond to noise all the time. So um, what we find then is that it really depends on the kind of environment you're in. So basically on, like, on, on the costs. Um, if it's beneficial or not to be here at these low, medium, near, nearest neighbor distances so at, at this uh, critical, to the critical point. Um, but that also for some, for some environments, there's these, this other maximum, which is better and which corresponds to the point where individuals have the most access, like direct access to the predator. So it's, it's this maximum here where you can see the predator best yourself. Um, yeah. And so, so basically we think maybe the, the fish that we see, they are actually not at the critical point because yeah, because I mean, their environment is very safe. And so there is basically no cost uh, associated to, to missing out uh, to, yeah, to not responding. And so they basically, you could characterize it by, by one of these gray curves. And then it actually makes sense to be somewhere around here where you can see maxima, maximally yourself. Okay, and so uh, an outlook is that, as I said before, we looked at fish in the lab and actually it would be good to have fish that uh, live in their natural environment where evolution has, has shaped them to be good at detecting predators and where they are actually real predators and, uh, and also noise. And also it would be good to have larger schools so then you can uh, do more um, detailed statistics or maybe even look at naturally occurring fluctuations in density and see if they correlate with cascade size. And, and some of these things will be addressed in, in the next talk by Lewis. And 
yeah, this is just the summary of what I did. And this is all the collaborators and the papers that we wrote and the paper that we built on. Yeah, thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Vini. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk and a very beautiful work. Uh, so, any questions? May I put uh, one or two? <laughs> oh, yes, please, uh, please go ahead. Thank program. you. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for this very interesting and very inspiring talk. In fact, uh, both questions concern your talk and also Pavel's talk. I was going also to ask him. So what now I am asking you. Uh, uh, you know, just at the beginning, you mentioned uh, two points, which was mentioned also by Pavel. First, when you spoke about brain, uh, you told, well, it is close to critical state, it is known. And uh, when you showed us the plot, uh, the X variable was noise, kind of noise, which brings the system to the critical state. Uh, when you speak about brain, what would be the parameter which is believed to be tuned to bring the brain to the critical state? Or maybe it is not one parameter, maybe it is a set of parameters. And then I put my second question. Mm -hmm. um, well, for the brain, I know there's, I don't know what exactly, but there's studies where you, where you have give some drug, I think, so like some chemicals, and then you can tune the state of the brain, but maybe Pavel knows if there's also something about the structure which I don't which I don't know. So mm -hmm. Pavel is muted, I think. Okay, maybe I can jump in there because um, yes, so please. For, uh, that's very general question. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so for the brain, actually, there is um, the core control parameter people believe plays a role is actually the strength of the synaptic strength. So basically, uh, the strength of the connection between different neurons, so the link strength. Um, and there are actually even mechanisms proposed, uh, there's a PRL paper by Bornholm and Rolf from Bremen, where they propose a, a self-organized mechanism, how individual neurons can tune their synaptic strength to the neighbors in order to tune the whole network to criticality. So this is beautiful work uh, from 2004, I think. So this is definitely one aspect, tuning the, you know, the, the, the synaptic strength. Um, however, as, as Vinny said, also the structure will play a role. And this is, um, there are, for example, this works on dysfunctional brain networks where you don't think of networks between neurons, but rather think uh, on, of networks between different brain regions. And people believe that also this uh, uh, functional networks can actually operate close to criticality However, these networks can dynamically change uh, in their structure, and it could be that this plays a role um, in what kind of mode the network is, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a kind of at a critical point or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, basically, it was about critical state, uh, also to say human, if we are thinking about human, of human connectome. So the whole connectome is the critical state by the strengths of, of synapses and yeah. maybe of something else. So maybe yeah. one, one brief note on this, because um, there's something which uh, is, is, is a big topic in neuroscience, which is, uh, I hope I get this right term, which is called hom homostatic plus, uh, uh, homostasis, basically, where you have a balance or balanced neuronal network, where you have a balance between inhibition and activation, because you can have mm -hmm. positive feedback effects and negative feedback effects. Yeah. There's a huge field of neuroscience that looks just at this balanced networks where exactly the inhibition and, and uh, activation balances. And as far as I know, and as far as I see it, but also others like Thilo Gross, it's essentially, you know, tuning the network to being critical by balancing this inhibition and activation. So by balancing the two types of strengths towards each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but no one calls it like this. So, you know, there's neuroscience is a well-established concept, but no one really calls this criticality or links this to criticality. Yeah. Thank you both very much. And uh, the second question is the following. Again, to the beginning of the first talk and of the second talk. When you were showing us examples of, of collective behavior, uh, definitely we saw some structures. And when I looked on these structures, uh, I saw that some structures differ from the others. And then I have a question, whether the number of possible patterns 
uh, is observed in such experiments. Say I see only three possible patterns or four possible patterns. And in principle, is the number of possible patterns fixed? I ask it, ask it again because from uh, because about uh, some uh, looking for some analogy in physics when we have topological charge and, and so on. And when you say have this fish and this fish, uh, I remember Pavel once told me that sometimes you are speaking about fish in two dimensions because basically it is gradient of temperature and fish likes to, to live in two dimensions maybe. Maybe this fish is in two dimensions uh, show only two or three possible patterns or five, I don't know. What is in experiment and in principle, what is expectations from, from the theory? So I can maybe address this as well. <laughs> um, sorry for jumping in. So essentially in 2D, it's, I think it's pretty well understood. So there are three fundamental states that the school or a flock can be in in 2D which is like the ordered state, orientation in ordered ferromagnetic state, so to say. Then there you have, you can have like a rotating state, like a milling state, where you have like a vortex. Mm -hmm. And the third one is actually a disordered cohesive state. Um, so, and uh, which for fish one typically refers to as shoals. So this is in 2D, and this is what you observe in experiments. The vortex state is actually pretty hard to obtain with open boundary conditions. It's possible if you have some kind of strong long range attraction to get this, mm -hmm. but you basically need global attraction and you can get like rotating states. Uh, with only local attraction, it's much, much harder. So there's, I think, a lot of open questions. Mm -hmm. But anyway, in, from an experimental point of view, Ian Cousin, who is a fish biologist who I collaborate a lot or we collaborate a lot on, he actually believes that these rotational states that we sometimes see also in nature, that they actually always happen because of confinement. Either mm -hmm. in the lab because of find a tank, so the fish just notice they are in a closed room and they just want to move, so they start spinning. Or in an open uh, ocean, when you observe these things, you actually typically observe them when there are predators around. So they provide like a dynamic confinement. Yeah. And the fish yeah. just start to rotate because it's the Very only good. They yeah. keep moving, stay as a group dynamically, but not run into predators. Yeah. So this Very, are yeah. Very interesting. For, Very interesting. Thank you. For 3D, there are actually a bit more states. And mm -hmm. there are some examples from this work by Kalovi that really just shows nicely. Um, so they actually observed um, in their model of 3D, which was parameterized by experimental data, some additional state, like a tube state, for example, uh, mm -hmm. which apparently they also found evidence, uh, like snapshots, like here in, in this picture, um, how relevant the states are in experiment. Um, it's not clear, but you can observe them at least both in simulations and in, in uh, real world. I see. I see. Okay. okay, so thank you very much, Vini, and thank you very much, Pavel. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Reinhard, please. Yeah. I also have a question to both of you because it concerns, uh, I mean, in the first talk, it was said that uh, you have an ordering uh, of this uh, direction of the velocity, also Mermin Mark, Wagner theorems would say you do not have in two-dimensional an ordering. And uh, if I look at these uh, different geometries of the uh, flocks, what do you know about the internal excitations? Uh, so if you have a disturbance coming from the outside, how the reaction goes through the flock? Do you know anything about like, well, I would say in a magnet you have spin waves. Do we have similar excitations in the flock itself if an external disturbance come? You mean if it if it differs from the different configurations or just if we have Of course, I would expect it differs for different configurations, like uh, the possible uh, 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 waves you may have in 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 a. Uh, depending on the boundary condition in a in a line or on a drum or so, so you might have exit reactions which go through the flock itself by some frequency or something. Do you know something about that? What do you mean by by some frequency? I mean what I what I show here we have. This is not really an external like we don't know what it is, but it's definitely. 
some reaction going through this flock. And I mean, we haven't, I haven't done these experiments, but I think they, um, there's also in the same group experiments with a predator, a pike, I think, and they can also see escape waves going through. So that is some sort of external input, but like frequency, would you mean like they have a, their own characteristic fre frequency at which they yes, that might be, this that by might be because they have some there's some velocity which can go through and and you may have an exit a final excitation which might change if you have a stronger influence from outside something like that um, so you can yeah, you just <laughs> I mean <laughs> Lewis is definitely going to talk about uh, waves going through fish schools as well and maybe we can discuss it also again after yeah. after his talk because yeah. they they show some very also some it seems intrinsic intrinsic uh patterns of of activation which are really cool okay uh, yeah and just part maybe of brief comment from my side on this so i think this is also like an important distinction here which where this what vinnie talked about is different from what i've talked about um, so here we have more like a, a you know, percolation or like a, a contagion process spreading, uh, which is a different type of a critical behavior than, for example, the orientational um, uh, spread, like mm -hmm. in a symmetry breaking transition. And regarding spin waves, yes, people describe spin waves as well in this type of flocking models. Yeah. And you can measure them. There's actually a, a theory of sound modes, how this propagates. Yes, this yes. System. Um, and so you can measure this, the sound modes, and you can you can find the interesting thing is that the sound velocity is already in a simple, homogeneously ordered state, will depend on the direction, you know, because you get an anisotropic spread of uh, based whether it goes parallel to the movement direction or perpendicular to this. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you will also have like kind of forbidden regions, so you will have certain sound modes or certain ranges in the, in the frequency spectrum which are not allowed, which are forbidden. Uh, because of this uh, active movement. So there is some work on this. I'm not really an expert. That's uh, interesting, yes. Uh, but basically, based on the Tonan 2 theory and Suram Ramaswamy um, also looked at this. So if one searches for sound waves and flocking models, one finds some theory on this. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question, maybe. Uh, it is uh, quite related to what uh, Reinhardt is asking, but it is a, a little bit of a more global thing. Uh, just suppose that you have such a structure, or you have this ensemble, then a predator comes. How much time is needed to pass into the fully ordered state? And then vice versa, if the predator goes away, the system dissolves in some way. How much time is needed to dissolve? How fast it is done? as a function of the number of objects, for instance, and uh, other parameters? I don't, I don't know that it would be, that it is studied in respect with the number of individuals. Uh, I know that in, in one of the publications, so in uh, the one with the Schreckstoff, that one, there's a figure, which I did not include in the talk, uh, about um, the time actually, the, the time evolution of the nearest neighbor distance, and there you can see it, it's like a really abrupt within I think seconds that it that it goes down when you spray the the shrek stuff on the water. So that is when the first fish would be injured, and and uh, the shrek stuff can be smelled, and then it like it slowly um, decreases, increases again the distance between the uh -huh. individuals. Uh -huh. um, but it would be really nice to to see. What happens if you have a large, larger school, for example, um, if an attack happens on one end of the school, then not everybody will be able to immediately smell that there was an attack. And then it would be nice to to have a model of um, how individuals actually can can maybe react to density changes that are that are just very local, and how maybe those density changes also propagate independently of this uh, Schreckstoff substance. And also uh, another very fascinating thing is uh, then, of course, that uh, the stretch of stays at, at one part, uh, like it's in the water. So when the school moves, it, it's information that stays um, local in the environment. So I, I think that's also kind of fascinating, even if it's not answering the question. Mm -hmm. But like many, many fascinating problems with this, I think. 
So may, maybe, uh, Vinny, you could uh, remind us what the time scale is of the speed of this cascades, maybe. Just, you know, what is the fastest time scales in the system? Because uh, I, was it like half a second or? I would. Uh, like the duration of the cascade. So <laughs> you have the image. We can, we can, sorry, there's no time. I don't have an image of the time duration. I just know this is like, what is it? It says this is half speed. So. But, but you had um, the, from Rosenthal, the cascade size snapshots. Yeah, but, but there was cascade sizes. There's no time in there. There is a time Where? on top. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's a time, I thought, in this small. Yes. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, so this, this OK, so here one can see that it's below one second that the school can basically do the transition um, to a OK. Mm -hmm. And because this is like this, this startle response, so this is the fastest response that they can do, the fastest acceleration, I assume this sets basically the lowest time scale in the system on, on the macro scale. I mean, the fish itself may have a reaction time. Is this a time scale you have to, the microscopic time scale, so to say? It's the reaction time of the fish. Mm -hmm. So for the startle response, there is actually quantification of this reaction time. Um, and it's believed, depending on the fish species, to be of the order of 100 milliseconds. Yeah. Uh, I think that the very fastest reaction times is of the order of uh, 50 milliseconds, but this requires that you get a particular activation through so-called lateral line, which is basically like touch on the water or, or pressure differences. Mm -hmm. With respect to vision, it's much slower. So if you have visual interaction, it's more of 100 milliseconds. Okay. Okay, any other question? Okay, let us uh, thank the speaker again.